Okay, looks like we're, like we're recording. So, I want to make a few comments about the first chapter of this week's reading from the textbook. And to begin with, um, I find it interesting that the text equates con consequentialism with teleology. Now, on the one hand, I have seen other texts that also equate the one term with the other, but I'm not sure if it's really a good fit because here's the thing, teleology refers to uh, a reason or explanation for something as a function of its end, purpose, or goal, as opposed to a, as a function of its cause. So say, for example, the purpose of a knife is to cut or to slice. We can talk about the purpose of a knife without talking about the knife maker. So uh, theories of teleology have some overlap with ethics insofar as some of them go so far as to uh, set forth some explanation of the purpose of being human. And you have very different ethical understandings depending upon what that purpose is. So I think consequentialism might fall under teleology, but I don't think teleology is necessarily quite the same thing as consequentialism. Next thing, the authors uh, choose an interesting starting point by looking at putative ethical egoism, both act egoism and rule egoism. But the reason why I hedge uh, that statement with the word putative is that I question their egoism is actually a legitimate school of ethics. Consider ethics is usually understood as being other regarding. Um, it's about how we should engage with and treat others in a social context. After all, if one of the readings to date, the authors went so far as to suggest that Robinson Crusoe on his island in isolation can't really be spoken of as a moral or ethical being until such time as he has someone else to engage with. As contrasted, this ethical egoism is prescribed in the social context, but since it is entirely oriented towards self-interest, is it really other regarding? Well, let me turn to my PowerPoint for a moment because I have some images that illustrate points that I want to make. So, so that being said, maybe we can rationalize the authors beginning with egoism because after all, egoism maps fairly neatly onto at least the first two three moral stages in Kohlberg's model of moral development, maybe even stages three or four. Technically, I think we could make an argument that you aren't really moving from morals to ethics until you get to stage five, where people start to become aware that there's such a thing as uh, unjust laws. So, <clears throat> To that extent, it might be an apt starting point in terms of human psychology, but I'm not sure if egoism is ethical in the true sense of ethics as opposed to morals. The authors state that Epicurus was a universal ethical egoist. Well, I'm sorry folks, but I have a point that I'd like to make here. Uh, I'm very fond of the ancient philosophers and Epicurus is one of my faves. So I'm a, but I might have a bit of bias here. Now, it's true that Epicurus adhered to what's called the pleasure principle. The notion of the good life well lived, what in Greek was known as eudaimonia, was about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. But that has often led to the mistaken belief that Epicurus was a hedonist. No, he was not. The pleasures he extolled were simple and modest pleasures, pleasures that are both natural and necessary. 
For Epicurus, natural necess necessary included simple food, good conversation, and company. It did not, however, include marriage, which he regarded as natural but not necessary, nor pursuit of luxury or extreme indulgence. Thus, the Epicureans tended to live simple lives, usually in communes, and one of the chief and cardinal pleasures Epicurus held forth about extensively was the pleasure of friendship. And for him, friendship was about a loving bond of mutual regard in which you held your friend's well-being on a par with your own. Thus, I think the authors might have gone a bit amiss by characterizing Epicurus as a universal ethical egoist, because if you are considering the well-being of your friend on a par with your own well-being, uh, is it all about your own self-interest? He's very clear that a true friend should be willing to make sacrifices to help their friends. One thing that strikes me in reading this chapter is that the writers seem to assume a distinctively Western understanding of a word that probably seems very simple and obvious to most of you, which is the word self. How do we define ourselves as selves? While the Occidental or Western understanding of self has sometimes been characterized as atomistic individuality, there are, however, societies where people construct their sense of self around relationality, uh, how they interact with those around them. Put another way, in the West, people tend to identify who they are by how they stand apart or are distinct from each other. Whereas in some societies, people focus much more on how they connect with each other. Now, both of these propositions are true. We are each of us separate and distinct individuals, but we're also part of a greater whole. In the West, we tend to focus on the former but in a lot of other societies in the world, the focus is much more on the latter. And that's why rights discourses come in the West. The old man, I know my rights. That's atomistic individuality. But in many other societies, the focus is much more upon mutual duties. Let me make a few comments then about utilitarianism. The text mentions a number of issues with utilitarianism, but I think it skips some important ones. Both addict and rural utilitarianism state that we should make choices on the basis of what would maximize the happiness of the greatest number of people. But here's the problem. How do we define happiness? Does everyone find happiness in the same exact things in the same exact way? Obviously not. There's also the problem of whether the ends justified the means. You could conceivably justify almost anything, I think, under uh, utilitarianism if you were convinced that it would lead to better overall consequences for everyone. For example, Truman's rationale for using the atom bomb on Hiroshima was essentially utilitarian. Military experts thought that far more people were likely to die in a land invasion of Japan rather, versus uh, dropping the bomb. Two problems with that, however. In his statement about the dropping of the bomb, Truman equated this with deploying 20,000 tons of TNT. But TNT doesn't leave ongoing damage from radioactive fallout. Much of the suffering of civilians after the bombing was because of the effects of fallout a consequence which Truman apparently had not anticipated. Moreover, the attack was in direct violation of the requirements of jus in bello, that's justice during war under the just war theory, which imposes a duty to minimize deaths to non-combatants. But that's a matter of duty ethics, which is covered in the next chapter and I will also film a uh, commentary about that. Another issue, what about the rights of minority groups? If the happiness of 
the majority depends upon the enslavement or the exploitation of a minority group would not be justified under utilitarianism. I don't see how you can get out from under that if you have a small group whose suffering um, enables the delight and happiness of a much larger group. Well, that could be justified because it contributes to the greater happiness of the whole which I don't know about you all, but I find that very troubling. Finally, if you look at the print version of this announcement, I have a link to a video that sets forth in a very colorful and whimsical fashion, the classic problem known as the trolley problem, which is a classic take on the issues and the problems with utilitarian um, ethics. So there you have it. That, those are my thoughts and my comments on the uh, chapter about consequentialist ethics. I will be filming another commentary on um, Kantian or otherwise known as deontological or duty ethics. I'm not sure if I'll have time enough to get to that today or if I'll do that tomorrow. We'll see. Ciao for now.